we saw the mess and I put it back and I went and got Sandy. But uh, I the convinced other, Sandy, I'm like, let's at least do a video yeah. on this and see what people think. No, we I was being videoed, but <laughs> but there's no way we could use it. <laughs> My job really is to try and dispel as many of these silly rumors that are out there. And this is the only way to really do it because the normal press doesn't want anything to do with uh, the kind of discussion that we had here today. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, my name is Barry Kresh. I see a lot of names I'm not familiar with. I'm the president of the EV Club of Connecticut. And with me is Paul Brerin, who is the one who put this meeting together. So we owe him the thanks for that. And uh, we're very happy to um, welcome Sandy Monroe and Corey Steuben of uh, Monroe and Associates. And with that, I just want to say a thank you to those people who participated with us in the Fairfield First Responder Training. And I will turn it over to Paul. So take it away. Thank you, Barry. Yeah, I was one of those participants in Fairfield today where they looked under my Model 3, took the shroud off and looked at the quick disconnect, talked about how the fuse blows when airbags go off. It was really cool to meet those folks. So for those of you that don't know EV Club of Connecticut, that's the kind of volunteer work that uh, Barry does a great job getting the word out on, on our evclubct.com website. But with that, I want to get right back to why we're here today. And that is Corey and Sandy. I get to meet them uh, about a year and a half ago in the middle of winter near Boston. And it was really amazing uh, what a crowd they gathered around their Model S that they were about to tear apart. This is a Model S Plaid, not just any Model S. And yeah. sitting there behind the yoke, knowing I'd see the parts on YouTube a couple of weeks later, just <laughs> fun for me. And I'm going to show you why that's particularly fun for a nerd like me, because I'm going to remove the background blur and start with a question to get some audience participation. I know you're muted, but I want you to practice that little button, the gestures where you can raise your hand. So if someone knows what they're looking at and Sandy and Corey cannot answer, what's this round thing behind me on the wall? Does anyone know? And Corey is smirking, Sandy's smirking. They know what it is. It's signed by somebody who's on this call. Ooh. There's my hint. <laughs> All right. Do I see any hands? Does anyone know how to figure out how to do the Zoom hand raise? Or just nobody knows the answer? All right. I know microphones are muted generally here. Okay. We have no takers. So do I even ask my tougher question? And that is, what is that other thingamajig behind me that's rather large? And I'll give you a hint on that one too. See a bunch of electronics there. You see some safety gloves. Those are my hints. It might have something to do with a tent. Did you know uh, some cars have a tent? All right, there we go. So someone, Gavin Watson answered in the chat, by the way, Tesla motor internal plate. What do you think, Sandy and Corey? Ding, ding, ding. Close uh, enough. It's close, close enough. enough. Yeah. <laughs> you want to correct them? Laminate, but there you are. Yeah. And then the, oh, we, we're not on the second one yet. Well, go no on. one answered it. So go for it. What are we seeing behind me here? Looks uh, like the electronics bay. Yeah, it's the charge module and the DC to DC converter yeah. on top of the cooling plate, which is under yeah. the penthouse on the on the battery. Yeah, not only a Model 3, a Model Y, and the Model S all use all similar componentry. Yeah. Exactly. Some, some changes happened only because they either upgraded a little bit or uh, moved away from an outside supplier and decided to do it on their own. Uh, that's what Tesla does. <clears throat> But they're all pretty much the same. Yeah, yeah having which... yeah having the DC to DC converter integrated onto that plate is really unique. Most other OEMs have separate DC to DC right. converters, and on Tesla Investor Day, they announced they're switching to forty eight volts. I don't know if you caught that in the uh, yeah. thing. So that's where the conversion will take place. So they're right. currently converting from three fifty or four hundred volts, depending on how nominal it is down to 12, really it's like 13.5 volts, they'll just convert to 48 and supply the whole car uh, moving forward. So that's right. where the magic will happen is a small corner of that board. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, can everyone tell we're going to have some fun today? <laughs> and the first responders mm -hmm. and I were talking about that. I was showing a picture on my phone, like, here's what a 48 volt looks like. Uh, sorry, 48 volts coming. One guy knew that in the whole crowd. And I said, but here's today's 18 volt lithium with this tiny battery trying to explain how that looks very different than my 2018 Model 3. So the answer is 2018 Model 3. And yes, it's a power conversion system or PCS is what Tesla calls it. And sometimes they fail. My car is 70,000 miles. I happen to be one of them. It happens. And what happens is your charge rate slows. So Tesla lets you keep old parts. And yes, you see my red safety gloves there, not being an idiot on touching anything there. But 
anyhow, with that, I, uh, you're here for ask your questions, right? We have a lot of people joining. Some people know Sandy Monroe's channel, and some of you don't. Basically, if you could just give a quick overview, both of you, Sandy and Corey, on uh, your history there in the last three years where you've really taken yeah. off on YouTube. All right. Yeah. Well, Sandy Monroe founded the engineering firm Monroe & Associates in 1988. Yeah. And we've been benchmarking cars essentially for the past 30, 30, 40 years. Yeah. Uh, but only recently when the pandemic hit, uh, did I nudge Sandy to start disseminating some of our teardowns on YouTube. The pandemic really necessitated that because typically we have a lot of customers and clients come into our facility. We have a nice 50, 60,000 square foot facility here. And because we couldn't have people on site, it's like, wait, let's get the word out some somehow. So the first 40 videos were done in a real guerrilla style using mm. iPhones and limited editing. <clears throat> and Sandy kind of rose to internet stardom because of his raw, unfiltered, unscripted style of describing the Model Y that we were tearing down. So we had one of the early Model Ys. We started tearing it down. So mm -hmm. since that, uh, from March to June of 2020, uh, we doubled and tripled down on our teardown efforts, and we've acquired multiple EVs. We tear them down. We write reports. We're still an engineering firm by day, and um, that's the main way that we stay in business. We have almost 100 employees. Uh, but the YouTube channel is a is a unique way for us to kind of disseminate the 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 prowess of our engineers because we don't have YouTubers describing what they think they see. We have a team of really educated engineers that are are able to convey a, a deeper message in our videos. Hmm. Yeah, I think uh, uh, what I should emphasize a little bit is that. When Corey said we did very little editing, that would be zero. <laughs> we we did almost no editing at all um, Early because on. we yeah. yeah we just didn't have enough time and we didn't have really the equipment. Um, now with um, Eric and uh, Grace and Aaron, um, we can we can do things a little more in a professional fashion. All this razzle dazzle here with the microphones and everything. This is uh, this is not Corey and I. Corey and I. All we do is like, uh, like I say, uh, an iPhone and away well, we go. I purchased all this stuff before Eric and Zach and Aaron were here. And we never used it. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> so there you go. So we have, right. to, we have to, actually, oh, yeah. I just found out that um, the ocular thing that we have, um, Grace is going to take it home and see if she can find something for it to do. It's been sitting on the shelf for two years. <laughs> we didn't do anything with it. So, um, but uh, but I, I think that one of the other things that I, I'd like to discuss is who are the Monroe uh, live listeners or whatever. And today we had, uh, I don't know if I can use their name, but anyway, today we had some folks come in to uh, get a tour and whatnot and uh, some deep dive engineering. And what wound up happening was uh, the one guy came over and he said, uh, I never heard of you before, but my son, who's 15, he has, and he he really wants me to take a picture of you. So I took a picture with him and his dad, gave him a couple of hats, and his son is like over the top. So we have a lot of very young, uh, well, not actually, we got them younger than that. We got one that one kid that came up to us when we were in um, California. I forgot which town, but anyways, one of them. And um, he was like seven years old. And then I've had a couple of uh, kids come up to me, actually one in particular in the lumber yard who uh, was very precocious, really a smart kid. <laughs> I'm surprised uh, I could even understand him. He had a huge vocabulary. But we seem to have a great deal of young people watching the, the program. And then we've got people who uh, have made the transition that are in some cases a lot older than I am. So it's it's really kind of a broad audience that we've got. It's not just engineers. Yeah. Thank you so much. And um, as we're talking in the chat, I'm trying to get people to queue up their questions now and put the little hand raise gesture by clicking on reactions. It says the word raise hand so that I know that you'd like right to speak rather than have me read your question aloud. Um, hey, back to kind of you and what you do in the history. It was talking to these firemen and first responders just like three hours ago. It was a lot of fun talking about you guys and what you do and capturing you know, as soon as I said you take apart cars, they're kind of thinking, oh, just YouTube for ripping apart cars or 
it's not that it's not a stunt, right? And you guys yeah. take it further and you kind of publicly embarrass Ford with their HVAC system to show how many cables and how much weight there is <laughs> and all that fluid. But that you're one laughing. Of our best, that's, that's one of my, that's the exactly. only acting job I've ever done on this uh, program. <laughs> But you didn't push it so far to piss off Ford enough to not have their CEO show up and talk to you. That's yeah. the cool thing, right? You're balancing that fine line, being brutally honest, but it worked, right? Yeah. I mean, you're seeing revisions on both Tesla's side and Ford. And for me, that's what won me over as a nerd. Not well, just something to watch, but that was just fantastic. Yeah. And when we first pulled the, the frunk out of the Mach-E, <clears throat> we saw the mess and I put it back and I went and got Sandy. This is before yeah. we filmed. And when we pulled it off, and he saw it, he almost bailed on the teardown. You yeah. almost thought, oh, man, <laughs> nobody's going to want to buy this it's report. Waste, oh, man. it's a waste. Because we still had time to, like, reverse course and not do the teardown. But uh, I convinced other... Sandy. I'm like, let's at least do a video yeah. on this and see what people think. No, we. I was being videoed. But <laughs> but there's no way we could use it. <laughs> the expletives, I, uh, I am a factory rat. I've been – I've lived my whole life basically in factories and whatnot. And when I saw it, um, I don't know exactly what we said, but I knew we weren't going to be putting it up. That was definitely edited, heavily edited, like chopped. Everything was completely gone. And then the idea of uh, of being revived with the octo valve, uh, there was some discussion on that, but I thought it was a great idea. And, um, and it did work out. A lot of people thought it was hilarious. Yeah. What's cool too, like it's super bottle, evolves into octo valve. You show a model by yeah. later and how far they've come. But again, you're, you're trying to hold your feet to the fire to the industry saying, hey, Detroit, like, wake up. This is where you guys are near Detroit, right? Yeah. In a constructive way, right? You're not bash. You're just saying, hey, industry, you got to wake up. And you don't mince words about how you feel about how far ahead Tesla is. Technically, they have their issues, right, with support and some service. By the way, I was not stranded with this part. They handled it quite well here in Milford, Connecticut, servicing it. Never, you know, 70,000 miles later, I'm quite happy. Most people, it's like that, right? But there are some rough edges with any company, and you call out those rough edges, including electrification of, or sorry, DC fast charging. What a problem that has been. And right here in Connecticut, yeah. right over the border in Brewster, we have one of the first magic docks, and I was there filming. That was a lot of fun to see the reactions of people in their Teslas, seeing Rivians and Mach-E's pull up, and some trouble with Ionics not charging at all. Uh, early adopter pain, just like Europe had a year ago when they opened up the right. network over there. Um, do you guys have plans or I think a tweet went out where you're trying to get your hands on a supercharger, like a V4 from Europe would be cool. Yeah. I guess you well, probably can't say anything about that. And how the likelihood of Tesla uh, shipping you that from Buffalo seems pretty slim, but we, be cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, yeah, we, we have, uh, we have one V4 on the, on the floor. Right Ooh. Now. But, well, yeah, it's, it's not a it's, Tesla. One. It's not a Tesla one. Okay. I'd like to have a Tesla one. And then we've done a, a multitude of home chargers. So uh, nice. Uh, so we we've done quite a bit of work in that area, and um, and quite frankly, the one we got on the floor is apart from Tesla is our favorite. They um, their their chargers work really really well, um, and I don't think it hurts to say the name ABB. Um, if you've got people who have to charge things other than a Tesla, look on the uh, as you're staring at the charger. Look on the left hand side. If it says ABB, you're probably going to be happy. It doesn't matter whether it says Electrify America or EVgo or whatever. The, uh, the 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 chargers are not made by those guys. They they buy whatever they can get as cheap as they can get. But the ABB chargers, if you've got something other than a Tesla, work work well. But they're really heavy, and um, and I'm looking forward to um, uh, Tesla opening up. Uh, the ability to charge your vehicles at their charging stations. Just get an adapter, click, and away you go. And yeah, it's an interesting launch, too. They picked um, a not-so-busy location, Brewster, and a spread across upstate New York, one along Long Island and two California, right? They're dipping their toe in. Yeah. In Europe, the V4 shows up the same week, basically, or about a week later. But anyhow, back to Brewster. I was there the day after MKBHD and Tom Malogny looking at that place carefully and laughing how you could get an F-150 to charge lightning. With one inch to spare, if you got right up to the bollard, yeah. a day later, Tesla rips them out. I mean, that's how quickly they pivot. I don't know if they had to ask the Dunkin' Donuts they're leasing the land from, but the bollards were gone when I came back two days later and recorded video like, hey, the bollards are gone. It's just an example of, that's fast. Would Electrify America do that? I mean, it was a black eye. It's a, one of the early doctor sites. They know mm -hmm. big time YouTubers are looking at that site carefully, and they fixed it. 
that's important. <laughs> it yeah. shows an effort to make it work for all the different cars, right. the brands, yeah. even with the stubby cable. All right, we have a great question from a very patient Aaron Hall with his hand up. So Aaron, that sounds like you want me to unmute your mic. And here you go. You are ready. You're unmuted. Hi, gentlemen. A uh, huge fan. I've been following you for uh, uh, a long time. I worked with Tesla from the launch of Model S through the launch of Model 3. I teach high school for a living and then uh, uh, was doing the education part of it. Really enjoyed that. Um, I still have my stock. I own a Model Y and I just put my parents in a Model Y. So really briefly on the steering wheel thing, but more importantly, the the quotes that you had recently about the battery pack irrep irreparability and your any comments you have on um, the Washington Post article about the camera situation. Usually the FUD comes out and people freak out and it doesn't really matter. I'm I'm hodl, hold on for dear life uh, long term, but um, very curious about anything you can share with us about, you know, recommending the cars to family members and stuff with this, the, the battery issues and the camera uh, issues for full self-driving. Thank you so much for taking the question. So, so yeah. I'll, I'll take the battery quote that Sandy was quoted in. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. seen, you've been quoted all over the internet. Really? Yeah. No. Essentially when we were tearing down the 4680, you said that the battery pack is essentially irreparable because it's all foam together. Right. It took a tremendous amount of time, effort, money, and energy for us to peel the lid off, let alone, uh, peel the yeah. top of the the there's a collector plates on top of the cells so it was taken a little bit out of context in my opinion because the articles that were written i saw one on zero hedge i saw one all over the place they they were extrapolating saying that an expert auto expert in detroit says that it's an irreparable pack and then they're saying oh if you get a scratch on the battery pack you got a total oh i did not say that i know so they, they were kind of combining the, what they wanted to say. They were co combining not. the the fact that insurers <laughs> were scrapping cars and Sandy's comment of irreparability. So we always say, choose one or the other, serviceability or reliability. And when you eliminate serviceability by you eliminating fasteners, you're increasing the quality of the pack. And Sandy can talk about this. Yeah. Um, when everything's glued together or bonded together, it, it, it creates an incredibly robust, solid assembly that uh, eliminates the propensity for fasteners to fail, welds to fail. But if something does fail inside of that, you essentially cannot go in and service that. Right. Uh, BMW i3, when they initially launched their pack had a very low gravimetric and volumet volumetric density. This was in 2014, but man, could you service it? You could yeah. take the lid off. You could uh, yeah. easily disconnect the wires. They even had little spots for the, for the cables, cables to set yeah. and you could unbolt them and take out one eighth of the battery with your hands clearing the whole thing. It was like a service center's dream, hmm. but the vehicle suffered from a gravimetric and volumetric perspective of the density of those Samsung SDI prismatic cells it, because it were, they were, it was an aluminum pack that bolted in and with an aluminum cover. So, and then the second thing you said, the Washington Post about the FUD, I don't know, Sandy, I'm not watching the news. I've been busy. No, I didn't today. either. Um, Can you explain a little bit about what that is? Yeah. So basically, they were critiquing um, Musk for his jumping on Twitter and uh, quoting several former employees. I, I always, uh, as a former employee myself, I've never spoken to the press about that because it seems like a gotcha game or disgruntled folks. But they they were arguing that the decision to remove LIDAR, to remove other visualizations, uh, took Tesla's advantage in full self-driving away. Not the the yeah. the argument about semantics about whether full self-driving is autonomous or whatever but just that that took the eye off the ball and they found a couple of disgruntled engineers to argue that musk's drive to do the impossible was made further more difficult because of that and i know you guys do the teardown so i'm not sure i, I may be asking off target but if you have any comments on that would love to hear them. yeah okay so um as far as i'm concerned full, full self-driving is um uh, a myth by everybody until we start moving toward FLIR, forward-looking infrared. Um, I'm not a big fan of LIDAR. 
Uh, not at all, actually. I, uh, the cameras are fine as long as they're clear and clean. And everything works fine as long as it's a sunny day and your car is clean. Then I guess that, that could work. But that isn't the case. So if it's raining or snowing, or if you have a uh, fog, you, you basically do not have the ability to uh, see through fog. But you do if you go to if you, if you go to um, if you go to FLIR forward looking infrared. Um, so Monroe and Associates does a lot of work in the auto industry and medical and stuff like that. But basically, half the company is on uh, <clears throat> is working on defense projects. I've worked on a ton of bombs, bullets, uh, missiles, whatever. And I never once used uh, ordinary cameras or FLIR, uh, sorry, or uh, LIDAR. I only used FLIR. That's it. That's the only thing I know because it works. And I know that it'll work every, every time, no matter what. You can see through everything. That's the only thing that, uh, that I, I profess. Whether you want to try and take this out or put that in or what have you, I don't care. It doesn't work as far as I'm concerned. The only thing that's going to work is forward-looking infrared, period. Um, so that's that's kind of... And by the way, that stuff on the battery and whatnot, the reason that everybody in the, uh, in the newspaper world will jump on that is because <clears throat> they're trying to sell newspapers. And when they sell newspapers, that means that somebody is going to put an ad in those papers. And Tesla doesn't put ads in papers. So guess who's the evilest person on the planet? Elon Musk. If you don't give us ads, we are going to throw you under the bus. And they do that. And that's just the way it is. As far as the other stuff, a scratch on the side will cause it. Obviously, that man has never done anything in engineering. My guess is um, his job uh, might have been... Maybe he was uh, glorious at washing dishes or handing out hamburgers or something uh, before he got to be a, a newspaper reporter. But I can tell you one thing for sure. You do not scratch. You do not scratch any of the batteries in Tesla and cause them to erupt or fail. That's just plain old bull. And by the way, this I got some guy phone me up, some newspaper guy phone me up this morning and talking and i had no idea what he was talking about he didn't refer to anything that i could go in and, and research and quite frankly today was a very very busy today day for me and i i didn't really research into it but anybody that says that oh uh sandy said this which is correct and then adds you know deep industry engineering fact that i just came up with and i do have uh, you know um a bachelor of fine arts or something that uh, that really doesn't go at all at all for me i don't i don't buy into it it's just another newspaper guy trying to peddle blood and um basically pulling facts out of his ass that's how it works appreciate it appreciate it and this this ev club proved the supercharger network work back in the day uh by running seven model s and and the ombudsman at, at new york times uh just basically slapped him back for uh, one of the early auto journalists who was supporting ICE. I dominate, I've uh, monopolized too much, but I appreciate your answers, guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no problem. You're muted, Paul. Thank you for that. Hit the wrong button when trying to mute him. All right. So Stanislav has the next question queued up. But for those following in the Zoom chat, I'll just point out that I threw a car vehicles by fire type where a pretty popular uh, auto insurance article. It's hard to tell how reputable, but something like one one thirtieth is likely for an EV to go up in flames as a PHEV. So just think about that, right? It's just like you guys were saying, think about your sources of your information and don't jump to conclusions based on, you know, one tweet or an article. But let's move on. Keep it happy and keep rolling here. So let's go to uh, that question I'm trying to find again. There it is, Stanislav. Let me go so back. So I, I can say it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, uh, Paul and everyone from Connecticut for putting this together. Uh, thank you, uh, Sandy and uh, um, Corey uh, coming on board. We actually met in, uh, in uh, fully charged in, uh, in September last year. Um, I'm uh, very excited about Aptera. I invested, um, and uh, 
I'm, I'm just curious. There are so many things that I could ask, but just uh, I can start with uh, this this one. So when uh, when they announced the launch edition, they said, "Okay, we will not have DC fast charging," and there was lots of outcry. And a few days later, they said, "Okay, okay, we are putting it back. We are putting it back, right?" And then in the context of what's going on now with the, with the Tesla opening up. Uh, it, it's just, I'm just curious how it's going to work because they have the Tesla plug, but um, uh, so, so will, the, will the DC fast charging work directly? How, how, how does it work? Thank you. You are on mute. Working to unmute Eric. Give me a second here. Yeah. yeah. No, I, yep. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. So, so anyway, um, yeah, back to Aptera. I, um, I was in High Point, um, uh, North Carolina last week and, um, to talk to them, they, they are buying a fleet or bought a fleet of 100 Aptera vehicles. And the, the fleet is going to be basically given away, um, uh, by, uh, a, a complicated system of um, what would that be classified as, as, as uh, improvements that people have done to the, um, uh, to the, to the grid or, or maybe to, um, you know, in, enhance their, their house so that their EV uh, or sorry, they've, they've got uh, solar panels and whatnot. So they don't need to depend so much on the grid, these kinds of things. It's a kind of a very complicated deal, but in that deal, they show 100 Apteras that are ready to rock right now. The um, the uh, the plug that's in there. So let's go back a little bit further. I wasn't aware that they were going to uh, tell everybody that, hey, um, we're not going to we're not going to have the uh, the um, uh, fast charging system in the car. Uh, but as soon as I got the word, I, I bet you I was one of the first, well, at least first thousand to send a note back saying, what in the hell are you two guys? What are you doing? And, uh, and they put it back in. They wanted to have a cost reduction. It's more expensive to have that particular component in. They thought, oh, well, this, this will be a good idea. And you don't decontent. If people are interested in a product, then you should give them what you said you're going to give them. You don't. So I'm, I'm also an investor. I also have one on order. Um, and I'm also one of their suppliers. We've supplied them with um, engineering, plant layout, uh, assistance, all kinds of things, finding new customer, uh, sorry, suppliers and everything. But um, I wasn't aware that they were going to say that, but um, uh, both uh Oh, Steve and Chris sent me a note back saying, oh, we made a mistake. We're going to correct it tomorrow. Uh, and I'm surprised that their internet, internet still worked after, um, after making that announcement. So I believe that there won't be any problem. Um, that's a relatively small battery that they have. Um, I mean, you plug it in, but it'll be charged in no time flat. Because mostly it's looking at, uh, you know, you're, you're looking at getting solar power. So I don't. I don't think you're going to have any problems uh, anymore. Uh, in fact, I could almost guarantee it. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Thank you. Next, we have Frank. Uh, let's see, Frank Hall. And is your hand up? Mm, Frank Hall, you want me to read? Okay, your hand's not up. I'll go ahead and read your question. So you, have a, you said there's a lot of talk about charging batteries that tend to make them deteriorate quicker. So now we're talking about longevity batteries, long life. Is that true? Thanks. And it sounds like, um, well, we're probably about to talk about LFP and chemistries and stuff. So yeah, if you could kind of recap your thoughts on that for Frank Hall. Appreciate it. Yeah, I can do this. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so 1,500 DC fast charging cycles, I think, is a widely published a limit for a battery before you get to 80%. I, I don't remember the exact literature, but I think it's 1500, which is quite a bit. And, um, and if the question's related to um, whether you're always DC fast charging or charging at home, it's always better to charge slower. 
always better yeah. and not to not to 100%. And Sandy, you you own multiple EVs. What's your right. charging habits? Um, mostly what we do, I charge at work. Um, we have, uh, that's a company benefit here. If you've got an EV, you can charge here. We have six, six or seven, six or seven charging, uh, systems and, um, and you can plug in and get it for free and it's a slow charge. It, it's... um, it takes like four hours or something like that to go from, uh, 20%, 15 or 20% up to about 80%. And, if you can continue to do that to go from like 20 to 80 continuously it it doesn't really hurt the battery a heck of a lot so out there there's a company called test loop or a system called test loop and these guys have um they've been driving from la to las vegas uh with high rollers so they have model y's and model s's old ones and they just ride back and forth. That's all they do all the time. Some uh, some high rollers, believe it or not, don't want to gamble on an airplane ride. Who'd have thunk it? But anyways, these guys have got, in some cases, three quarters of a million miles. They probably got a million miles on them now. And uh, they don't seem to have any problem. The 1500 cycles, I don't know where that came from, but it has a lot to do, I think, with what kind of batteries you're fooling around with. I don't think pouch stand up nearly as well as what the cylindrical ones do. Um, that's my own personal opinion, and I don't have an awful lot of data to back that up. But I know that <clears throat> as batteries expand and, comp uh, and uh, contract, um, that has a tendency to uh, kick the daylights out of pouches. The jelly rolls, they don't, they don't expand much and they don't contract much. So that's kind of like where you're going to get dendrils, uh, dendrites. Dendrites, sorry. That's where you're going to get them building up. They're little, they're little um, needles that grow, and uh, and basically once they've gone through the barrier to the other side of the barrier, then that's when you're going to get a, a battery failure, um, or it'll cause some some problem of some sort. Uh, I don't uh, I don't see that happening as much in uh, cylindrical as I do with pouch batteries. So a related thought would be those 4680s, a new form factor. The initial look at them seems to be a little disappointing, but they're still developing the chemistry and what's inside and how they're made, clearly. Uh, you have hopes for that to be, um, you know, two, three years from now to be a much better way to go for a lot of cars, including LFP chemistry inside, uh, yeah, right? There's a it lot could... of cars. Sorry. There's a yeah. lot of car companies that are, are making a switch right now to go to cylindrical. GM was the latest to make an announcement. Um, when we went to the uh, the investors uh, program that they had down in Austin, Texas, Corey and I got the chance to see the real deal where they make this new dry cell. And I am telling you what, I was totally blown away. Mm -hmm. And the drier it is, the less likelihood you're going to get dendr uh, 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 dendrites. So I think that um, I think that um, coming up, we're going to see uh, an improvement. But there's even something that's better um, that uh, that we're all hoping for, <clears throat> and then that's um, that's solid state sitting on um, sitting on my desk as a somewhere as a folder. I'm going to be giving a, a a speech on battery technology. And in there is what I think is the real deal when it comes to a solid state battery. It's uh, it's actually using metal deposition or 3D printing. You call it whatever you want. Some people call it additive manufacturing. This is the real, this is what I think may be the, the holy grail or what we could move to. And that will last indefinitely. Yeah. And the big benefit there is a higher uh, kilowatt hours per kilogram, kilogram or watt hours watt per hours kilogram, per kilogram. Yeah. Uh, upwards of 450 to 480 <clears throat> watt yeah. hours per kilogram where tesla is more in the range of 250 to 320 depending on if you're thinking at a pack level or at a module or cell level right and um that that increase in gravimetric and volumetric density allows you to either use less cells or use less mass of battery so that you lower the weight of the vehicle, thus increasing range, or you can increase range with the same amount of volume and mass. So um, you'll first see solid state deployed in high performance scenarios, whether that mm. actually aerospace, 
um, That's aerospace, way. space, or VTOLs, high performance hypercars, where uh, energy density and mass is at a premium. Mm -hmm. And then you'll see penetration into the mass market probably uh, three to 10 years after that as it becomes more uh, readily available. But Well, it depends on how fast they can get the cost down. We should also maybe talk about SES, actually, which is in Boston. Um, we went to have a look at them. They also have uh, a battery system that's uh, quite a bit different. They have something um, lithium that's metal. called lithium metal. Um, and that um, that has a lot of promise. And it also has something like about four, eight, uh, four 450, 450 um, watt hours, watt -hours, per, hours kilogram. per kilogram. So that's very, very high. Uh, they're not into production yet, but they have... They definitely have got uh, something that's worth looking yeah, at. They're, they're backed by Hyundai, Honda, and General Motors. I, I think, think they're so. partial yeah. owners. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so they got deep pockets and people who probably uh, probably going to survive what's going on next. Actually, GM's got their foot in a lot of different um, technologies. They, they have uh, something going on with LG, although I have no idea why. If LG dumped me in a and I wound up with 130,000 cars I had to basically scrap. I wouldn't be happy with them. But they're also looking at jelly or cylindricals. And um, and they're also in with um, SES uh, as, uh, as an investor. So, Okay, thank you so much. We have a theme developing here in the questions. Let me jump to the battery-related ones while we're on that topic. Patrick Sullivan says... I have a 2014 Model S. The vehicle charges quite slowly at superchargers. Nodding your head. Uh, a few years ago, Tesla updated software, which throttled down the rate of charge. Makes the con car undesirable for long trips. Do you happen to know anything about this, and is there a fix? Ooh. So early, <laughs> early on in our benchmarking endeavors, we had uh, Model S's and Model X's. Yeah. And frankly, those early Model S's and X's are designed like traditional OEMs design vehicles probably in 2018 to 2019 with a fragmented architecture. So I remember that vehicle having a disassociated yeah. charge module. So what you're showing uh, on your on your little dresser back there, you called it the PCS. To me, it's the charge module, DC to DC converter. It's the discrete components, componentry on there. Um it would the Model S in 2014 would have a separate box. It's probably rated at a relatively low wattage, so you're limited by the hardware on the car, and then any software limiting. Um, I don't know the reasoning behind that. That's kind of unfortunate. I remember seeing that in the news, but frankly, uh, if you buy um, a Chevy Bolt, I think they have a really yeah. low uh, kilowatt rated charge module, so you're limited by the hardware that's deployed on the vehicle. And, mm. and unfortunately in 2014, the hardware was way different. If you buy a new model S or X, it'll have exactly what you're looking at over his shoulder uh, because mm. they, they put the latest and greatest technology in the S and the X and they've completely obsoleted all that old stuff. So as hard as it is for me to say, maybe time to upgrade your model S to something yeah. newer. Uh, or 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 keep it as a well. No, there's a, yeah. there's another option. Um, there's a guy called Pete Gruber, and um, he uh, he can um, sometimes change things around. He's oh, yeah. kind of like the expert when it comes to uh, upgrading upgrading your car or taking. Uh, he's really famous for taking dead uh, roadsters and uh, reviving them. So if anybody knows, it's not going to be us for that because that's before our time. But I think that Pete could probably uh, Pete could probably help out, or he might be able to help out. So reach out, Pete Gruber is his name. Y you uh, look him on the web; you'll he you'll be able to find him. Okay, great. I threw it in the chat. Pete Gruber's homepage there, and we have a question from Stanislav again. Uh, well, actually, no, I'm going to go back to Dell Weston's question because it's on the topic of chargers. And Randy, I see your hand up. But let me just uh, go back to batteries and charging. So he's talking about Chevy and the Bolt. Um, I think it was just yesterday there was some PR about maybe 56% of the Bolt's batteries have been swapped so far. So it's taken GM a while to do the 100% fleet. 
Um, and I think, and nerfing might not be the right word, but limiting people to 80% and maybe gradually creeping up uh, while they wait the long wait to get the battery replaced seems to be Chevy's uh, current strategy on the bolt replacement. People might not be pleased with that, right? But they're trying to keep the car safe while the long yeah. wait is happening. Yep. So you don't get nasty signs telling you not to park in a certain garage and all that. I don't know if that's working or not, but that leads all to Del Weston's question. Here's what he says. Chevy doesn't seem to show concern for charging the newest bolts to 100% constantly. Please comment. They're, they're wise in, in saying that. Um, again, they don't know how many of these um, pouches were damaged. This was an LG issue, um, not a GM issue. GM is trying to do the right thing as far as safety is concerned, and uh, they should be applauded. Did they have the right partner? Maybe not. Like I said, I'd be very, very unhappy if I was a big shot at General Motors and LG threw our name under the bus, GM's name under the bus, and then ran over it several times, maybe like 130,000 times. So that's that's where I would be. Uh, not not a happy uh, not a happy guy. So um, I would suggest that whatever General Motors has to say, that you, what you that's what you should probably do because probably 80, 90 percent of those battery packs are just fine. But um, if you happen to get one that's a 10 percenter or one of the outliers, um, it would make you yeah. very unhappy if your car caught now, on fire. Was the question about the new packs that are delivered? So there's the old ones, which that makes sense. Yeah. I think the question was the new ones they're saying only go to 100% probably when needed for road trips. Is that what the question was? No, I thought it was the old, the ones that have been replaced. There's like 56%. The new ones, they're yeah. still telling them to keep it down. On the new ones? Yeah, that's the question. No. Yeah, that was my question. Whether whether the the ones that are just mine is supposed to arrive this week, and and the they don't, didn't seem to have any concern about always charging to a hundred percent. But I'm not clear if I'm getting the right uh, the right info. I I don't understand if you've got the new battery pack. I don't understand why there would be a restriction. Um, uh, I'd have to know a lot more before I could make a comment on that. I thought you were talking about the old ones there. Absolutely. Don't, don't do anything except for what General Motors has told you to do the new ones. <clears throat> maybe they've lost faith completely in LG. I don't know, but, uh, the new ones should be should, an should ordinary be battery pack. It's just, it yeah. should be just fine. Yeah, that was my, I, I was here. I was hearing that you don't have to worry about going constantly to 100 percent and i just just wanted to get your feedback if, yeah, if you're that fine, seemed you're fine. So. yeah uh, but yeah. i wouldn't constantly do 100 percent because it does um especially on pouch type batteries it, it does wear them out faster so if you okay. can live with 20 to 80 all the time i mean and for a field trip uh, Corey and i i mean we we topped it up all the time uh to 100 percent uh when we were riding around uh, the US, but, but, um, and we never had any problems, but if you're just driving around town, you're not going on a long field trip, then keeping it around 80%, 20 to 80 is, it makes your battery feel happy. Yeah. And it doesn't, Thank you. and by the way, it's faster too. If you're at 20% and go to 80%, it's quick. When you get that last 10%, the last 10% is what really, it's about the same amount as going from 20 to 80, from 80 to 100, um, it'll take you about the same amount of time. All right, thanks. Welcome. All right, thank you, Del, for, for clarifying the nature of that question. And um, yeah, I mean, just for people listening along and hearing this, LFP is something you might hear, and there's like a Tesla standard range plus that has that. That is a car where you just slide the slider up to 100% and you can just leave it there and not be road tripping within a few hours. You could just yeah. let it sit for days. That's a different thing, though. Uh, with the Bolt, maybe it's just Chevy's way of saying, yes, we have confidence this battery's safe. But as Sandy said, you don't want to do that on a day-to-day -day basis unless you're taking a long-distance road trip. But the LFP is a, <clears throat> the LFB is, that's that's your best battery for long range. Um, one of the guys here in uh, Detroit, um, Mujab ID, sorry, Mujib 
iJazz, um, he uh, took a Model S Plaid battery out, put his LFP battery into the same vehicle, connected it up, and he drove basically from Ann Arbor to, uh, sorry, what's the name of that place up north? Um, Traverse City. Traverse City, which is a long ways up north, drove it all the way back down to Detroit, then all the way back up to Auburn Hills and still had a little more to go. That's the kind of range that if you're going on a long trip and you're not really interested in drag racing on the way, that's the battery that can really help you out. And it it doesn't care. If you want to charge it to 100%, no, no big deal. It, uh, it doesn't yeah, care. And it, the materials in it are cheaper. Yeah, way cheaper. Iron is, I think, the most abundant uh, yeah. material on earth, right? Uh, so uh, it's the most element of why is it uh, i think hydrogen is the most uh prominent because of the oceans and whatnot but oh no no the whole earth is iron yeah the that's whole true. mantle and core well yeah, i think you're I'm no to geologist change. but yeah, well, iron and uh lithium iron phosphate are really common and lithium is actually relatively common people think it's scarce but it, there's a ton of it everywhere yeah. there's no monopoly on it or anything yeah the scarcity is when you try and refine it and nickel and cobalt are the materials that are harder to get. So if you really want an economy pack, you suffer a little bit from a volumetric perspective because they get about 50 to 55 kilowatt hours of energy in the same space in a Model 3 pack or Model Y pack that they get 73 to 82 kilowatt hours with uh, cobalt and, and nickel in uh, an NCMA cells in 2170 so mm -hmm. you actually get a higher performance and a little bit more energy density uh from 2170s and that type of uh well power is the big thing you get more power out of the out of the um lithium ion um that's where they you get the big jolt that sh shoots your head backwards um uh, you won't get that with uh, lfp and some people don't care as a matter of fact i just did a test drive in a car that has uh, pouch batteries, I think, mm -hmm. and um, uh, lithium ion. And um, believe me, <laughs> that was not a rocket ship. That was grandma's car. And uh, it was a Hyundai was, Ionic all wheel drive. Yeah. Really loaded. He thinks I it's couldn't. slow. I, I think mm -hmm. it's 4.50 to 60. So no. your threshold uh, for speed is so high now. Have Sorry, you heard I, too hey, here's the thing Sue, my wife, Dr. Sue. Um, mm -hmm. she, uh, drove it and, um, she said, there's too many buttons. There's this, there's that. How come we're not making these happen faster and whatnot? And my wife is definitely, she doesn't like driving with me because she said I'm a maniac, but at the end of the day, even she said, man, it's tough to, uh, man, it's tough to get, uh, um, uh, to get this thing up to speed. So, um, <laughs> once you, once you have a rivian or a, or a tesla or actually any of the cars that are that are quick it's very difficult to go backwards to something that's not so, quick so yeah so, i mean the lightning sends your head back i mean uh the lightning the maki uh polestar all almost every car that we've had this is the first one i've had that I was wondering if I should, you know, tear a hole in the floorboards and go Fred Flintstone and <laughs> pedal it along. I was, I was unhappy. And Sandy, to clarify, you mean lithium ion? You mean the standard chemistry, nickel, manganese, yeah, cobalt, right. aluminum, the yeah. the standard, right? You were just saying lithium ion. You got to add yeah. all that, all right? Versus okay. LFP. Yeah. So yeah, with you guys seeing so many brands and seeing the industry as a whole, it's not just Tesla doing the standard range plus with going to LFP recently. Right, that's a change in chemistry on the existing car. It got a little heavier, a little slower, zero to sixty, I think five point eight now, but they've done it, and people could charge to one hundred percent every day. A completely different animal right. than the standard range plus when it first came out, and but others are doing that too. Um, yeah, and you're seeing that more and more brands doing that with their lower and mid range cars. Right, they're following that model. Well, it, it's cheaper. There. It's much much cheaper. the yeah. most expensive thing in in the electric vehicle the is the battery, yeah. and um, and it's the heaviest single component. Yeah, it's the battery. On our Model Y, we did a full cost analysis. Just the cost of the battery was 24% of the cost of the vehicle. Yeah. Cost, so not cost, price, cost. Yeah. So it'd be interesting if you look eight years in the future, some of those long range standard uh, Model 3s from 2018 
we'll probably have about the same range as some of the newer like 2021 lfp based standard range plus yep they'll meet because oh, yeah. right because the long term you can have that degradation on the traditional right. yeah. yeah okay so that's a good pivot well, you you mentioned uh Corey, you're not a geologist <laughs> daniel whiteley jr asks any comments on the new rare earthless motors so rare earth material you know, yeah, motors that do yeah. not use yeah, rare earth minerals. yeah so th they'll still have magnets in the yeah. rotors, but they'll just use standard magnets, which right. are used all over in industry. A lot of hybrids mm -hmm. had just standard ferrous magnets inside of them, right? Sam? Right, yeah. The Perfect. the big element, neodymium, is um is something that is kind of expensive. Um, it takes quite a bit more to process than than everything else, and it does give you, um, depending on how you configure them. They can give you wicked speed, unbelievable speeds, um, but um, most people don't need those wicked speeds. So yeah, it's uh, it's not that so, big a deal. On Tesla Investor Day, they said <sighs> that the new drive unit would cost roughly a thousand dollars. Put that in perspective; that's a little bit over a fifty, maybe a sixty percent cost reduction right. of what a normal drive unit would cost: gearbox, motor, oiling and cooling system integrated to that, and inverter. So we've costed 14 of these drive units and they're expensive. Some are as high as $3,500. Yeah. Some are in the $2,500 range. So to get it down to a thousand, you have to get there two ways. You got to eliminate rare earth. You have to go to hairpin for the stator. And then you have to uh, reduce your reliance on silicon carbide for the uh, MOSFETs or IGBTs, depending on how you're setting up your inverter. If you can eliminate it, so they, Tesla stated they're going to reduce. I like to turn off Bill's light. Oh, pardon me. Hello. I think it's a mistake. I'll mute him. Just keep continuing. Okay. Um, oh. So they, uh, you have to eliminate the, uh, the dependence on silicon carbide for MOSFETs and IGBTs because that's a huge cost driver. So if you pull all that out, the cost of the aluminum and the steel for the gearbox and the housing is relatively low. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, the next if, big hitters, yeah, the, is the magnets. Yep. Yeah, the magnets, and that they essentially stated their plan in the investor day. And now, if you're a supplier out there, you're a Magna or Borg Warner, and you're selling drive units that are expensive, that are twenty five hundred or eighteen hundred or three thousand dollars. You just swallowed real hard because an OEM said that they're making their own drive units and they're a thousand dollars. So that means every large vestigial OEM like Ford, GM, VW is going to go to these suppliers and say, "Where's my thousand dollar drive unit?" Yeah. The, another key thing is, in order for it to be that price, you're going to sacrifice some functional objectives. Those functional objectives will be performance and power. If you want a high performance, high power drive unit. Buy a plaid that's wrapped in carbon fiber and has really nice magnets and has a high-end, high-power inverter. But so this will most likely be in the 150 to 200 horsepower range for the drive unit, which would be about half of what half of the power you can get out of a drive unit from a from a plaid. I think uh, in a long-range rear-wheel drive, it's in the high 200s for horsepower, right. which doesn't have the carbon fiber-wrapped rotor. So. It, this won't be a world beater of a drive unit, but it'll be appropriately sized, powered, and the appropriate cost for a high volume, low cost EV that they can sell all around the world for twenty five thousand, uh, or or a little bit more. But at the end of the day, you can't make uh, a Model Three like you can't just ring it out and turn it into the. So I've heard different things. I, I heard Highland. Uh, I don't know what what the name is going to be. Some people are calling it the Model Two, but but you can if you redesign it a bespoke unit, and you look at everything, everything in its um, in, in, like individuality. Then all of a sudden you're um, um, you're you're going to be looking at how do we reduce cost? How do we reduce the amount of paint that we're going to use? How do we how do we make it so there won't be as much assembly line? How much how much do we have to do, or what do we have to do to make all these things happen? And that's what Tesla really outlined at their investor day. And I'm telling you what, <laughs> Corey and I were stunned um, at that investor day with the unbelievable, unbelievable good ideas that they showed these 
people that in the audience. I mean, there was 200 people in there and, and I'd say 198 of them uh, were, Oh, I'm bored. I mean, bored. They, they showed us how they're welding the, um, the, the, the new electric motors together, these new hairpin motors. They showed us the dry process that they're using for the battery packs. They showed us all these, all these amazing things. But uh, I think in the, I've been using this term, too much probably but pearls to swine it was like phenomenal ideas but the that they but the people that were supposed to be soaking it up had no clue what they were talking yeah, about yeah and two other big things was the tesla os they talked about how they're right, employing the their own software engineers to develop software solutions for how they do back end processing of orders and inventory and uh ap and ar mm -hmm. that's something that i'm jealous of cuz Sandy and I, we have to buy boxed uh, software to run the business, whether mm -hmm. that's our uh, HR systems or our 401k. We have all these different software packages. And then uh, the other- and They never communicate with each other. Yeah. And um, when you try and drag data from one to the other, they forget or hiccup yeah. or what have you. It's, and, it's, and, it's, and the other thing was how they're assembling the vehicles. So- with the uh, large giga casting in the front, giga casting in the rear, the structural battery pack, the next step is to create large assemblies for the body sides and assemble it in a modular fashion. That is a huge impact to floor space utilization in the plant, particularly in the paint shop. So the paint robots currently have to articulate in crazy manners to go in and out and around uh, a fully assembled body when they're painting it. Uh, now, if you're painting, now if all those pieces are separate, the body sides of the doors, the hood, the deck lid, the fascias, uh, they can paint in a planar fashion. So essentially, you can align everything in fixtures in a plane, and that'll be a huge advantage to floor space utilization and robot complexity in the paint shop. And I'm not a paint shop person, but Sam, yeah. maybe you can expand on that. Yeah, too. well, at the end of the day, what you're going to have is uh, something that's going to move a whole lot faster. Robots uh, in the paint department maneuver so much that they slow things down considerably. The paint shop is always um, a bit of an issue, trying to get it so that you can get a good paint job and still get it without holding uh, holding up the rest of the assembly line. With these new, uh, this, it used to be called the lay down body side rail, that thing that is basically one half or one side of your car. By having that, as Corey said, planar, the, the robots don't have to do much of anything. They're just going to go up and down and around, and that 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 uh, uh, conveying system is just going to take it away. It'll be painted on both sides. You probably wind up with less paint being used. Well, no problem, but it will be less paint used. It's going to be a whole lot faster. And then when you slide those things out, they're going to be mounted directly to those castings. Those castings are going to give you the perfect fixture because the castings don't move. Sheet metal, when it's stamped, wiggles around. There's nothing you can do about it. So it'll go through, it'll get in there, they'll screw it or use uh, self-piercing rivets, but they'll also be adhesive of some sort. And when they get done, it's going to have a whole lot less, a whole lot less um, um, labor and uh, quite a bit of less, uh, an awful lot less uh, time to get them done. And by the way, the normal standard for for uh, a factory is stuck at is been stuck at uh, sixty seconds for quite some time. When Corey and I were walking through, I was timing the line, and they were at forty three seconds. That's a giant. Uh, that's a giant departure from sixty seconds. It makes a big, big deal with um, with how many cars you can get out the door. And they think they're going to go even faster in Mexico. So, hey, Sandy, um, I know to be respectful of Corey's time, he's got a bolt right now, and you graciously offered to stand a little longer. Corey, we have a real quick speed crown question. It takes five seconds to ask and two seconds to answer. Monarch, I'll unmute you in just a second. Monarch, you asked, what do you like better for a choice uh, if you had to pick, Corey? Rivian R1S, Volvo EC90, Kia EV9, or would you wait for Tesla if they're ever going to bring a minivan or van to market? Uh, Kia EV9. There's your short answer. Thank you, Corey. I know you got to go. Thank you so much. And, for an And I say that because I, I own a Kia. My wife drives a Kia Carnival minivan. 
and I really like it. And we've been benchmarking cars for the past 30 years, and a lot of our support for Fiat Chrysler automobiles, many of the Kias and Hyundais were top performers all around from a cost, value, uh, functional objective perspective. They were always really high performers, particularly from 2015 and on. So Kia and Hyundai do make really high quality products. So anyways, mm -hmm. that'd be my choice. I got to take off. Thank, Thanks. Thank it was nice so seeing much. everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. So Monarch, I've unmuted you. Um, you had a little bit of follow-up there. Yeah. I The reason I was asking is because I drive Model Y, uh, which can carry seven people, but that's not comfortable. On the, you know, that because Sandy spoke a lot about investor day, they were hiding two cars there under the white fabric. One of that was under the category of uh, the cyber truck. And hopefully that's a minivan, but that's why I was asking, should we wait until that long? Or if those EVs are coming out, which has, like when Hummer put the highest like battery out there on the, the, the General Motor put that on Hummer EV, I had a question, why would not put it on a minivan and make it more accessible to families, which has more kids, more elder people. So I would like to know, send his thought on that. Great, thank you. Yeah, well, um, I've been talking to uh, two OEMs and um, in both cases, I recommended that they have some sort of a minivan um, in their portfolio. Everybody is kind of looking for um the market that they'll be able to make the most money at and you make more money on trucks than anything else so pickup trucks or delivery vans things like that that's where that's where they make their money and that's what they'd like to focus on but i'm pretty sure that you're going to see in the very near future at least two vans that are going to be coming out that i think will easily um seat seven people one of them actually, I actually drove and spun around and stuff like that. It's the uh, the uh, canoe. That's that's something where you could have. It could be an ambulance. It could be a bunch of different things, but it could also be uh, a minivan that uh, that definitely would uh, would seat what six eight eight. They've got two uh, drop seats in the front, so maybe as as high as 10, 10 people in that minivan. That's that's kind of like that would be a really a killer if they could get it to market. But unfortunately, I think they ran out of cash as well. A lot of people that were involved in that, um, uh, like Silicon Valley Bank, um, are really hurting right now. They'll probably go under because their cash has disappeared, vanished. We have a question about um, Ionic 5s. It's a little trickier to ask this question. Those magic docs that let CCS cars, the EVs, charge at superchargers. That's one car that's getting uh, not too much luck. One person got to charge it for a few seconds. Someone in Europe under my video that has almost 10,000 people looking at it on my Tinker Try YouTube channel. Um, that's a lot of people and a lot of comments saying, hmm, not sure what's going on, but it hasn't been fixed in Europe for months, months either. Maybe this isn't a simple software fix, but do you happen to be aware of what might be going on? And with that, I'm going to introduce Ionic Guy here. Uh, Corbin's his name. I'm going to read his question aloud. But do you have any familiar with the Ionic? And I couldn't squeeze this question. I just drove one on a weekend. Awesome. Uh, that's the one that I was claiming I, I didn't much care for because it didn't go very quick. And um, I did not try charging it at a, uh, a normal charging station because it was given to me to discharge. Um, we're tearing it up, actually. Uh, they probably got wrenches on it right now. Okay, so yeah, what it specifically it's about this uh, eGMP platform where trying to get them to charge at these Tesla superchargers has been a challenge, right? So you got the software, the handshaking. The other cars that were there with me, uh, Lightning was no problem. Um, I believe maybe even some Genesis GV60, which is basically identical, it worked, but it has a later software. So the theory was maybe the Ionic with slightly older software just doesn't work yet. But it, it's just complicated because in Europe, it's not working either. And they've had the superchargers with CCS connectors much longer open to other cars. So it's just one of those industry things. I meant to pick um, Corey's brain before he left on it too. But um, And Corbin doesn't have a microphone today. Corbin, let me read the rest of your question aloud here to make sure I squeezed it in. Corbin, it looks like maybe we don't have a, any new insight into the whole eGMP thing. And honestly, I haven't read too much more into it in the last two weeks. But as far as I know... Of the 10, now 11 Magic Docs all over the U.S., New York and California only, excuse me, 
Of those, I don't think anyone successfully charged Ionic with a decent speed for any significant length of time. Mm. Please let me know if that's wrong, someone in the comments. Lee, I don't know if you meant to ask that privately, but it, I don't see anything weird about the question, so let me go ahead and read it. Uh, I have a Model X. It will charge kind of slowly for a few minutes and then uh, go down to 50 kilowatts, taking an hour to get to 150 miles at a supercharger. All right. So it sounds like he has some sort of DC fast charging issue. He's not talking about home charging. He's specifically talking about a DC situation. Sounds a little unusual to me. Anyone here, Sandy included, have you heard of a story of a supercharger story where a car itself is kind of going up and down at speed? I mean, it feels like he needs a service ticket with uh, Tesla. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. you uh, just beyond anything that, that we've seen, um, I would suggest that um, you call your, your agent, um, whoever whoever your agent is that's close to you to, to get into the uh, into the service bay and have them check it out. This is uh, this is not a, a question I can ask or answer um, quickly. I've never even heard of that before. Randy, my apologies. I am unmuting you now. Your question is a good one. I, excuse me. So go ahead and ask it about your model. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll focus on the question. I have a couple of comments about GM batteries and other things that I know about. But uh, the question I have is I've got a, a 2014 uh, Model S that's got 100,000 miles on it. Not a lot. I do road trips. And it's on its fourth, uh, now out of warranty, fourth um, motor repair, replacement, basically. Uh, it's a single, single engine <coughs> uh, car, rear mortar. Um, I know the second one, I am the second owner, good friend of mine owned it for a couple of years first. He had it replaced. Don't know what the reason was. I had mine replaced with a vibration in the motor and they just, you know, the, the car told me to bring it in. Uh, the last time that the motor just, just died, apparently got water in it. Uh, that's what they're telling me. And, uh, yeah. And I, consumer reports does show not a great resource probably, but, uh, does show that the model S early models S S's in particular do have, uh, uh, drive unit reliability issues, but uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm getting 25,000 miles on a, on a drive unit. Wonder what's going on. Actually, 33. I'm going on my fourth, so 33,000 miles on a drive unit, and that uh, seems pretty poor. <laughs> okay, what year did you say that thing was? 2014. It's 2014. Uh, okay, so I have absolutely zero experience on that, but I do know that your drive motor is probably induction, correct? That's correct. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So there's a reason why Tesla moves away from induction motors to yeah. PM motors, and uh, and they still have them in some places, but they don't they don't depend on them. Um, yeah. I think that um, um, uh, Nikola they, they, Tesla had a good idea, yeah. um, but yeah. it's not a good idea for everything. Um, they still use the induction when you have a dual motor because they can't they can't yeah. seem to get the uh, the two permanent magnet motors to work together. So most dual engines still have an induction in the back usually. Well, it's because it's like half the price. <laughs> they're they're very inexpensive. Um, yeah, Audi true. Audi uses them as well. Um, it's not yeah. because of uh, any other reason that they did when you when you put the two uh, types of motors in combination with each other, one helps each other at the beginning, the other one helps at the end. And it uh, basically it'll stretch out. It'll give it'll give you better mileage and stuff like that. So right, but yeah. 2014. Um, I unfortunately don't have a, a lot to tell you there. Again, Pete Gruber though he's been he's been cranking these things for quite some time. I would suggest that maybe he might be your best bet. Um, mm -hmm. He takes them in, he fixes them up, and sends them back out yeah. again. Yeah, Tesla's currently replacing my fourth, and yeah, it'd be about seven thousand. Okay, five thousand U.S. dollars for uh, for the motor itself. The whole full repair is closer to ten grand. But uh, anyway, that's it, it. You know, I haven't uh, paid for fuel for a lot of years, so that's wonderful. And yeah, this just seems to be the the one big problem that the early Teslas seem to have. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, if the form factor is there, maybe. <laughs> Maybe you should. Well, I don't know. You'd have to. I, I don't know. To, I was going to say swap it for a PM, but I don't yeah. know if you can do that. You'll you'll have to. That's something that only Pete Pete Gruber yeah. would know. Yeah, I have to say the battery is still at you know ninety four say three ninety four percent, so doing really well. I have one comment on. Uh, I also own a Spark, and uh, a good friend of mine has a Bolt. The batteries are. Uh, limited in the BMS to about 85 to 90% of their of their charge capacity. 
So my Spark, I charge to 100% all the time. It's still at 100% exactly as far as, as it was yeah. when I was born. Yeah. And it, 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 I know it takes about 17.4, 17.5 uh, kilowatt hours. It, the battery is, is uh, in fact, about 19.3. So it reserves the top and bottom. And uh, mm. that's what GM has been doing also on the Volt. So different, different story than the Tesla where you really want to watch your high and low. So it's, yeah. a, it's a different beast. Yeah, the, everything's different. The chemistry is different. The, yeah. Um, it's Form a, factor. It's about, yeah. yeah, everything. There's nothing the same about the two cars. Yeah, it's a pouch. Yeah. Two batteries. All right, Randy. All right. Thank you for your question. And um, thank you for clarifying how it's going with an actual Bolt story. What I alluded to earlier, <laughs> right? about 80, 80%. Yeah. That's where they're limiting. Okay, cool. Yeah. Hey, maybe we'll uh, bring this in for a landing as we wind down. Uh, with the, the charging question. So EV Club of Connecticut, we advocate for, you know, any brand of EV, try to help them be happy, help with home uh, charging in their garage and help answer the questions like, well, do you road trip often? And, you know, how important is DC fast charging to them? And at the, this moment in time, again, we, America has a ways to go to get out of trouble with Electrify America. And there's only a few magic docks, but there's hope that maybe there'll be thousands of magic dock equipped locations, but they'll still be really short cables. So Hopefully V4 superchargers roll out like crazy here is what I'm thinking. But as we go forward, Sandy, um, that's why I was asking like earlier for you guys to tear apart superchargers, looking at V3, V4, whatever. It's so like important to the industry because even though it's a Tesla logo in there, it seems to be $38,000 $38, to make one versus $115,000 or $130,000 for Electrify America charging um, dispenser. Ooh. So that technology yeah. behind it could really electrify America and sell a whole lot more EVs if we actually make progress in the next year or two on that. So I know personally, of, I think about that a lot. Yeah. One of the things that people forget is that um, Tesla is probably reusing car parts, right? <laughs> why, why would I even think about using anything but the inverter that I've got inside of a Model S or a Model 3 or whatever inside of my box? And, and quite frankly, that is a much higher level of sophistication that you're going to find in anything in anybody else's um uh in, in anybody else's boxes um even even abb doesn't have that that level of um of sophistication so you you look at these different factors and that's how tesla can um keep the prices down significantly because they just they have the effectiveness the efficiencies and they they've got a parts bin to die for Okay, no, thank you. I did sneak notice another question snuck in. Gopal, if you want to, nope, okay, you're not, your hand's not raised. Gopal asks, will Tesla's move to single casting molds make repairs of even minor fender benders exorbitantly expensive? Oh, I've heard this question. This should be good. No. The repair estimate for a scrape over the rear fender of my 2018 Tesla Model 3 is already high, $6,700. So yes, Ooh. giga casting, it makes for easy and cheaper manufacturer keeping the prices down for Tesla, but what about the insured customer who has to, to repair three, four years later, right? That's They'll never have to repair it, period. If you if you manage to get hit so hard that you break that casting, um, get out of the car, go down on your knees, and thank God because, uh, because you had those castings. Uh, they are infinitely stronger than um, than what you can get out of sheet metal, period. You're just not going to have, in fact, uh, we've seen in the last few days, people have been sending me little notes and whatnot. Several people have gone over cliffs. Some 18 year old oh. kid lost control, went over a cliff, went down, I don't know, 50, 60 feet or something like that, or meters and, uh, and survived. And then you've got other guy, one guy, I don't know what was he, what he was thinking, but he drove over the edge of a cliff in California, 250 feet crashed to the bottom and everybody survived. You're not going to get that in a, in a conventional. In fact, you know, people say, Oh, the, um, <laughs> actually I, uh, I'll do two. I'll, I'll tell you this and then I'll get onto the little funny story that I heard, uh, when I was in, uh, in North Carolina. So if you, if you look at dropping uh, a car with a gas tank, uh, associated with it, and you let it drop 250 feet, which means that you're going to get beyond critical, like um, um, you're, you're going to get beyond the the normal um, rate of descent that you're going to be able to get out of just dropping a rock. You'll you'll hit you'll hit the, uh, the uh, you'll terminal hit velocity. the yeah yeah terminal velocity. So when it hits the ground, 
<clears throat> there's going to be a lot of metal jumping all over the place. And when it does that, it's going to get plenty hot. And if you've got gasoline, you're going to explode. And yet, when this thing, when this Tesla went off the edge of the cliff, it crashed down to the bottom. Not only did everybody walk away, or at least were still alive, there was no explosion, no fire, no nothing. So that's one, that's the one story that you probably read in a newspaper. But the one that I was totally blown away with, I was with a bunch of students at, uh, at a university up there. And a guy said, um, and he was definitely embedded in ice. And, uh, and he said, well, you know, I just read in, uh, I think it was New York Times, that in New York, they have 10, 10 battery fires a day. And I stood there for a second and I said, I, I, I talked before I was thinking, I, I try to be sort of civil. Anyways, uh, he said that and I said, that is bull. Are you going to tell me that there's 3,650 car fires a year in New York City that are specifically, and then, well, that's what they said. And I said, I'd like to see that article he couldn't find it. I don't know if he made it up on the spot. Maybe you wanted to think that he was uh, being, you know, uh, cool or something. But at the end of the day, there's too many of these um, old wives stories is what they used to call them. I guess we can't, that wouldn't be politically correct, but we'll have to think of something new. But these things just do not happen. People have got to think about when somebody puts some story out like this, is this, is this for real? Could this possibly be happening? If you had that many car fires, sorry, battery fires anywhere, the press would be on it like white on rice. It's good. How in the heck could you possibly be thinking that this is this is the truth? I think what the American people really need is, um, is a few lessons in common sense. You can't you can't believe when somebody says that kind of stuff. And I'm sta I'm supposed to be, you know, civil and uh, how can you do anything else but go, what? What are you what are you drinking or thinking or uh, you know, or smoking, I guess. Uh, it just it just totally blew me away. I was I was I was totally flabbergasted when I heard that. Yeah. All right. Well, anyone have any other questions? I think I caught them all from the chat. And folks, if you're following along and you liked what happened in the Zoom. Go ahead and swipe your mouse across it and get it in your clipboard now. I'll probably publish it at some later date at TickerTrader.com with a replay of this YouTube that'll go on the EV Club of Connecticut website. So don't worry about getting this uh, replay of the Zoom to your friends and family. We'll have it on YouTube soon enough. Um, people are just saying thank you, Sandy, including Karen Kiki Adams. And uh, he says, what a pleasure to meet you. Love your YouTube channel. Great work. So thank you, Karen. What a nice way to end it. And Sandy, we thank you for your time staying extra long too. And it's really cool that you guys did this for many other podcasters recently as well. This community outreach beyond just the normal, you know, big channels or uh, auto line and other places we've seen you. That was really cool to do that to the smaller groups like our little state of Connecticut. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. And, and as far as I'm concerned, uh, my job really is to try and dispel as many of these silly rumors that are out there. And this is the only way to really do it because the normal press doesn't want anything to do with uh, the kind of discussion that we had here today. So okay. thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much.